Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning these are series of lectures which are being brought to you by the Indian Institute of technology and the Indian Institute of Science. Our area or domain is cultural studies and we have completed several lectures uh, by now and I hope you um, have been able to uh, get a grasp of some of the key concepts and formulations under the general or broader rubric of cultural studies. Let us do a recap of the last lecture which was entitled ethnicity, race and nation. You will recall that ethnicity, race and nation were seen as forms of cultural identity and uh, we had said that ethnicity, race and nation are by no means uh, terms that are used only in cultural studies. You know that these are also terms in sociology, political science, anthropology and even literature. But we also said that cultural, uh, cultural studies exploration of terms and uh, concepts like ethnicity, race and nation are looked at in a way that is different from the way these are looked at in domains such as sociology, political science, etcetera. Okay. We see these as cultural forms and forms that have to do with cultural identity. We also saw that as categories, these terms like ethnicity, race and nation are at once discursive, performative identity constructing, shifting and unstable in the sense that their, um, their meanings, definitions, their connotations are never fixed, but are, but take on, you know, different forms and meanings in different times. And finally, they are nodal points of identity and subjectivity. We uh, looked at race as a uh, something when looked at in cultural studies is seen as not being outside of representation, okay, which is again let me reiterate it is not to say that these are not realities or uh, you know that they are not uh, you know um, lived out in our, in our real lives. However, the, uh, the, the main point was that they are formed in and by symbolization. Okay. So, they are also matters of signs and signifying practices. Then when we looked at nation, we found that um, nation and ethnicity are closely allied to nationalism and that nation is a shared culture uh, as far as race and ethnicity are also concerned. Again, nation is culturally formed by contingent historical circumstances and a nation is a collective form of organization and identification. We also saw importantly for purposes of cultural studies that not only are nations uh, political organizations, but also equally importantly nations are cultural. Okay, nations have to do with lived lives, they have to do with symbols and images, they are to do with discursive practices, with descriptions, definitions, with language and finally, with representation. And we could easily say that vis-a-vis uh, -vis other domains or subjects, um, the second this is, um, this is what cultural studies is most concerned with as far as nation or even race and ethnicity are concerned. We also looked very briefly, we just mentioned um, an important book, Imagined Communities by 
uh, the well-known scholar Benedict Anderson and uh, we made this differentiation. We said that the nation is an imagined community, right? whereas national identity is the narrative of shared origins, symbols and rituals. Fine. So, this was a brief recap of the last lecture and we now move into lecture 7 in uh, module 3. Module 3 as you know is entitled sites and we have already been through several such sites of cultural studies that is where all these uh, the terms that we learned the concepts that we learned in, in module 2 are applied okay? and we are trying to see how culture happens in these sites. Okay? So, in this lecture the site that we are going to look at is globalization. Well, of course, globalization is um, such a huge topic and there are so many aspects to it and surely within um, the very limited scope of a single lecture, um, we are we shall not be able to, to really unpack the term. Okay? However, I would like to bring uh, you know to you um, at least some of the ways in which we can talk about globalization uh, particularly within a cultural studies framework. As always let me declare the key source texts in this lecture and the key source texts are Chris Barker's cultural studies theory and practice and uh, another very useful book the sage handbook of cultural analysis edited by Tony Bennett and John Fraw. Well, when we talk about globalization, it is generally held that there may be several positions taken by scholars not only in cultural studies, but also in kindred domains like sociology, anthropology etcetera. And these three positions may be called A hyper globalization, B transformationalism and C skepticism. Okay? So, it is really uh, given in one order as we shall see. Uh, nevertheless, the three positions as we said are what? Hyperglobalization, uh, transformationalism and skepticism. Now, let us look at these very briefly one by one. Hyperglobalization. Now, hyperglobalization is and um, you know is an attitude or even scholar scholarly orientation towards globalization okay, as a cultural, political, economic phenomenon. And um, you know this three, three sort of divisions have been made, uh, made with respect to the degree okay, with respect to the degree in which these orientations and the scholars belonging to these orientations look at um, the way globalization has happened or spread or you know uh, the way global the, the extent so to speak okay the extent to which globalization um, has been able to establish itself so hyperglobalization really is a term which is quite self explanatory as you will realize uh, the three ways in which we can describe hyperglobalization are a the incessant march of, of globalization. It is look, looked at you know, uh, you know we look at globalization under this uh, particular orientation as something that is sort of uh, that the sort of extending all over the globe okay, in which we can uh, which we can describe as an incessant march which is going to if not now eventually catch up okay, uh, with, uh, with all or eventually is going to happen in all parts of the globe. Okay. So, we can also if you look at the slide call it a globalizing imperative. Now, you know the meaning of imperative something that uh, which you cannot do without or something that is bound to happen or that we are bound to accept. Okay. So, hyper globalization sees that as if there is a globalizing imperative. Now, there are other terms related you know that which are used with imperative for instance if in philosophy you will find the categorical imperative okay, that is a without which not so uh, almost the categorical imperative uh, of um, Immanuel Kant 
in technology, in studies of science and technology, you also have a term like um, technological imperative. Okay? So, if you can understand it along similar lines, there is a globalizing imperative um, under this understanding of globalization as hyperglobalization. And third, it implies the impending end of nation states. Okay? So, it is not just globalization, it is hyperglobalization, which is uh, really um, revealed by words like these. Look at these words incessant march of globalization, a globalizing imperative, and finally, an impending end of nation states. Right? So, we get the idea that scholars under this group will see. Uh, or, or they look at the consider globalization as something that is bound so to speak to happen. Now, let us look at the two other ways or orientations of scholars as far as globalization is concerned. The next as you know is transformationalism and under transformationalism again this word like hyperglobalization is quite self explanatory, explanatory in the sense that it looks at uh, transformation. Okay? of uh, nation states. Here nation states irrevocably are affected or changed by globalization. So, it does not imply that all uh, sort of one uh, or nation states are sort of swallowed up by globalization, but there is an acceptance or there is an acknowledgement of the fact that nation states are undergoing transformation um, or they are changing because of the processes of globalization and these changes are usually irrevocable. That is the nation state can, does not go or uh, cannot retrace the steps that have been taken by it owing to globalization, but it also does not really signal what hyperglobalization calls the you know the impending doom right the impending doom of nation states. Okay. So, it uh, uh, suffice it for us to, uh, to uh, simply remember that uh, there is an acknowledgement of the fact that because, because of globalization nation states are changing. Finally, again the, the third way or third orientation of um, looking at globalization is skepticism. Right? Now, under uh, scholars under this framework of skepticism uh, are not ready to accept the fact that uh, either that nation states are uh, you know irrevocably changed by the globalizing process, nor um, uh, nor are they certainly willing to accept that you know there is an incessant march of globalization or that you know there is a globalizing imperative so to speak uh, in today's world um, as in the way that hyperglobalists uh, would believe okay so anyway these are the three ways and um, um, when you read uh, works on globalization. Now, that uh, you know that there are, there are these three ways of scholars looking at globalization, you should be able to place each critique or each scholar of, uh, of globalization uh, within one of these three different ways or orientations. Next, le let us move on and if um, Barker and other scholars agree that you know of all the processes that go into or that have gone into um, uh, you know the globalizing process uh, or the processes processes that underlie globalization may be broadly clubbed under a economics, b internationalism, and c information. Okay, so they understand or they say they acknowledge the fact that economics or uh, economic uh, transaction okay, economic flows um, is one very important process if not the most important process underlying globalization the spread first the establishment and then the spread of globalization. Okay. Second internationalism by internationalism is meant not simply the you know uh, not simply various nation states in uh, the world interacting with one another, it also means the presence and the ever uh, growing presence and importance and power of international bodies. For instance, the World Bank okay, and various multinational uh, companies that are spread uh, out all over the world. Okay. So, internationalism uh, is also another 
important process that underlies globalization that has made globalization happen. And finally, uh, and uh, you know not the least is information, information flows. Okay. Globalization has been able, it is, uh, ha has been able to happen or it is, it has uh, become possible so to speak or it would not have been possible so to speak had there not been information flows on a global scale on a huge scale okay especially the flow of electronic data right so so what are the processes um, that underlie uh, globalization the processes are economic flows internationalism and information flows uh, next a very important term right again um, uh, most of you are familiar with it but when we talk about globalization from a cultural studies perspective we need to look at neoliberalism okay please look at the slide neoliberalism um, neoliberalism may be may uh, be defined under four sort of um, four sort of processes okay a it is the liberalization of national markets, the open, uh, opening up of national markets, okay, the removal of, of several, um, so to speak, uh, 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 the removal of, uh, of several barriers okay, to the flow, uh, flow of, um, you know, to the economic flows among nations. Okay. So, the liberaliz liberalization or opening up of national markets, uh, which is a part of neoliberal, neoliberalism. Um, is extremely important or is one of the processes that uh, again um, makes globalization at least contemporary globalization possible. The second is the deregulation of capital flows when you do not have uh, very stringent uh, you know very stringent laws or rules or norms regarding the flow of capital from you know especially across borders okay. and where there are minimum trade restrictions and there is uh, you know one gives more rights to investors. Okay. So, I do not I don't, uh, need to uh, explain this in detail uh, because that would again belong to another field, but just to open up to unpack uh, globalization to you know uh, to, to you to uh, you know uh, uh, for this class, we may talk about uh, neoliberalism as one of the pillars so to speak of globalization, where we have deregulation of capital flows and liberalization of national markets, more rights to investors okay, and where trade restrictions are becoming uh, are at a minimal. Right? So, where finally, now coming to culture, how do we look at culture or what are the ways in which culture is looked okay, are studied under uh, you know the rubric of globalization. One of the first things to note here is culture, please look at the slide, culture here is an economic good, this is a most important point. Okay. So, culture is not separated here from economics, um, the cultural is also the economic okay. and it is part and parcel of the economic flow, so much so that culture becomes a matter of market of marketing culture becomes a good to be traded with other nations. Okay. So, we one of the ways in look of looking at culture here is not simply as a way of life. Okay. So, we also here will look at forms of culture that are produced that may be exchanged that may be traded with you know with other uh, nations. We looked at cultural products okay, that are also you know marketed. So, these uh, this aspect of culture as an economic good as a marketable good is part of also of the study of globalization under a cultural studies framework. So, here what happens is when we look at culture in terms of economic flows, we see um, certain similarities. right? So, let us look at this slide, this is a very important for us. For instance, A there would be no restrictions on cultural imports. right? Just look at you know recall the slide on neoliberalism, also the same thing is apparent here. Okay. The minimizing of restrictions, 
right? The uh, across borders, the flow not only of uh, economic uh, goods or the uh, flow not only of capital, okay, but also the flow of cultural imports with fewer restrictions than was seen, uh, you know, than was seen uh, maybe a few years ago. Next point is uh, that there is no or at least minimal protection of natural cultural forms. Okay. So, if there is uh, if, if there is under globalization uh, a readiness okay, to market cultural forms, a ready, readiness not to put uh, you know restrictions on different cultural imports. Okay. So, they, in the same way there is minimal protection of national cultural forms. Third, there is a tendency there is a tendency to encourage global mergers and joint ventures as far as culture is concerned. Now, here by culture certainly we do not mean only you know uh, the, the way the commonsensical use of the term uh, uh, cultural forms as dance, music etcetera. These are also for instance education right. Uh, the opening up of the education sector to uh, to parties beyond one's national boundaries. Okay. So, the encouragement or encouraging of global mergers and joint ventures as far as different cultural forms and institutions are concerned. Okay. And finally, uh, no or very little cultural autonomy to nations. Right. So, uh, this really is the crux uh, of you know uh, understanding culture, culture, the flow of culture under globalization. What are these? There are no or at least minimal restrictions on cultural imports. There is encouraging of joint ventures of global mergers for different cultural forms, products and institutions like education, minimal or no protection of national cultural forms and minimal cultural autonomy to nations. Okay. So, you see along with the flow of, of economics along with the flow of information along with internationalism. Okay. Cultural goods forms and institutions are also sort of neoliberalized. They are also being opened up to uh, you know uh, whether for consumption or enjoyment or investment right. These are also made readily available um, across, across national boundaries. Now, uh, I referred to, you know one of the key um, source texts is in, in this lecture apart from Barker's book is an essay by uh, Diana Crane which the essay which is in the uh, you know which talks about culture and globe, uh, you know globalization global flows. Okay. Uh, this uh, essay is in the book Sage Handbook of Cultural Analysis and let me now quote from Diana, uh, Diana Crane's essay in that, in that volume. The cultural equivalent, okay, let us underline this, the cultural equivalent of the neoliberal model of economic globalization. This is precisely what we had been um, talking about that there is a parallel to economic liberalization uh, in the parallel is found in this concept new concept of cultural neoliberalization. Okay. So, the cultural equivalent of the neoliberal model of economic globalization perceives globalization as a process that is producing globally transmitted cultures. Okay. Let us read this again the cultural equivalent of the neoliberal model of economic globalization perceives globalization as a process that is producing globally transmitted cultures which emanate from a hegemonic center. This is important. Okay. These globally transmitted cultures no matter way, where they come from, okay, no matter how diverse the nations or how you know uh, how uh, sort of uh, how um, far they are even physically from you know uh, from one another what happens is they ultimately emanate from a new center of power from a new hegemonic center. Now, let us read the read on consisting of a few dominant nations this is extremely important like uh, this is also a form of cultural internationalism if you like remember we talked about economics internationalism and what was the other term um, uh, uh, information flows right. So, what is happening here is 
as Diana Crane asserts that there is a new center of power, okay, which in which you know, um, uh, which causes the loss of cultural autonomy to nations, okay, because of deregularization. Uh, or deregulation as far as cultural flow is concerned. Okay? And the few dominant nations are now um, asserting their hegemony over uh, the heterogeneous, the variety of or the diverse cultural forms of so many uh, nations which are not hegemonic. Okay? So, consisting of a few dominant nations and which reduce, let us look at this slide please, which reduce the cultural autonomy of less powerful countries that constitute a weak periphery. Okay? So, the, um, this is a very important co um, you know, quotation or a very important extract from, from uh, Diana Crane that there is the formation of a new cultural hegemonic center, okay? a new cultural internationalism. Therefore, if we were to you know, characterize uh, globalization, Okay, not simply in terms of economics, but from a broader, you know, sort of speak cultural, cultural uh, studies perspective. Then we would say that uh, this uh, contemporary globalization is characterized, or the pillars, so to speak, are these. Just look at this slide A. Okay, for such a globalized situation to happen, there has to be a world capitalist economy. Okay? The economy has to be one that is driven by capital, that is driven by the flow of capital across breaking you know, national barriers, okay? uh, uh, which is a world uh, capitalist economy. Second, there has to be an information system in a global scale. Okay, so, that information can be derived from almost all parts of the world. Okay? And um, many nations can have access to information. Right? Of course, when you look at these first two, the world, uh, world capitalist economy, the global uh, information system, um, there is of course, you know, the, the question of access to both capital and information, right? which, is, um, which is such a huge divide. Right? So, uh, the third is that there is a nation state system all right we are not like the global uh, hyper globalist saying or you know that the nation state has disappeared okay the nation state system is there but the nation states um, of different parts of the world are increasingly partaking right in the world capitalist economy the global information system and are uh, you know uh, are causing mergers right and are enabling mergers global mergers to happen which affect you know all cultural systems which affect our way of living our way of life okay and which affect all the cultural or beginning to affect all the cultural institutions finally a world military order okay so these are the four uh, so to speak uh, pillars on which contemporary globalization stands today and which from the cultural su studies perspective is important because all of these have you know have led to uh, to the control and to, to a new hegemony of you know of uh, cultural forms and a new sort of new center and the new periphery in terms of in terms of cultural capital okay or in, in terms of um, in terms of ca capital uh, sorry cultural flows like economic flows therefore what is affected here right now if we talk about culture as ways of life what is affected right in all nations here are all nations economy technology culture pol politics and identity. In, in that sense, we say that globalization has touched, okay, if not irrevocably change, has touched all parts of our lives. Then let us read from here, globalization as uh, one of the critics says, globalization is not just an therefore, not just an economic matter, but is concerned with now concerned not simply with culture, but also with again and the most one of the most important terms in cultural studies okay it is concerned with issues of cultural meaning right 
while the values and meanings attached to place remain significant, we are increasingly involved in networks which extend far beyond our immediate physical locations. Right? So, uh, there are there seem to be therefore, two levels at which meaning meanings of culture happen. Okay? Uh, as this critic points here, as far as um, meanings attached or meanings which emanate from one's uh, you know uh, uh, from uh, from matters relating to place right to location while the values and meanings attached to place remain significant for us uh, the increasing reality uh, is that we are involved in networks uh, in the exchange of electronic networks of, of data right uh, which have no significance as far, far as place is concerned, as actual location is concerned, right? Uh, which extend far beyond our immediate physical location. So, as far as meaning is concerned, or even as far as value, uh, terms like value and significance are concerned, we find that things are happening at perhaps at two levels. One, which is an international one, where uh, you know there are no. Um, so to speak, where where place is not an important variable, okay. Uh, and on the other hand, we have certain meanings that are attached to locations and places. So there seems to be a dual, you know, a dual level of existence as far as cultural meaning, uh, values, and signification are concerned. Fine. Now another way of looking at globalization. Now. Um, um, pointing to something else that we um, than what we have been discussing is um, globalization is seen also as a series of processes which question the very concept of bounded societies and cultures. Okay. This is um, in fact celebrated by many scholars, celebrated by many critics, celebrated uh, by by uh, many many people with a certain orientation towards globalization. Okay. Now, look at the slide here please, they see globalization as a series of welcome processes, okay, which question the very concept of bounded societies and cultures. Now, this, this uh, we can relate to a very cliche term which is called the global village and that all the, the worlds a village etcetera and then there has to be constant and unregulated exchange of information of education of various cultural assets and resources okay, uh, apart from economics okay, all over the world. So, uh, they look these scholars look at globalization as uh, questioning the very concept or very even the questioning the very need for different nations to or societies to be bounded uh, to be autonomous and they look at it as the happy opening up so to speak of different cultures and their resources or so, this is the other way of looking at globalization and the uh, one and the uh, and, uh, the one that we uh, that many scholars also share okay uh, a different set of scholars really is that as you saw just a while ago that the very uh, you know um, opening up of these uh, bounded societies and cultures instead of that creating an equality has only created a new hegemonic center of powerful nations even as far as culture is concerned. Okay. So, uh, there is a, again a weak periphery cultural resources how again as I said however diverse however heterogeneous or coming from whichever part of the planet whichever nation is sort of appropriated if you may use the word uh, is appropriated these things are appropriated by this new you know cultural center and this new cultural hegemonic uh, center. Uh, is interestingly of course, also the center which has economic power or power over economic resources. So, instead as the other set of scholars I say as they argue instead of this creating a happy flow of culture is really only adding to the uh, adding to the inequalities that exist among nations. Okay. So, let us uh, again look at what Barker has to say again this is from his book cultural studies theory and practice. Much of the vocabulary of social and cultural change post Fordism, 
post industrial society, post modernization, etc. Now, look at this much of the vocabulary that is the discourse okay, of social and cultural change, contemporary social and cultural changes. This vocabulary or discourse has been absorbed into cultural studies. Okay. Further, cultural studies has tried to grasp these changes of these new societies or new arrangements, so to speak. Now, try to, to grasp these changes at the level of culture. Now, this is again as I have kept repeating uh, you know over and over again, not to do not simply to do with globalization, not simply to do with the topic of this lecture. Okay? Uh, I again would reiterate that many of you may feel that all even the terms, the sites, uh, even some of some of the scope of all these things that are discussed being discussed in these lectures in this virtual classrooms classes sorry on um, on cultural studies is not it is not that these are not taken up by uh, by other domains but as barker says here these are cultural studies has tried to grasp the changes at the level of culture okay this is most important for us uh, at the level of culture through what by doing what by exploring or through exploration of things like consumer culture, okay. What happens owing to globalization? What are uh, you know the orientations of consumers? What are the different consumer patterns that emerge? Okay. What are what is the power of uh, you know play of power and politics even at the level of consumption, um, not only of distribution and production of goods. Okay. Then what is this global culture? Uh, what is this global culture that we are talking about? Who uh, sort of who has a grasp or control over what um, uh, is available, so to speak, in global culture, and what is what to what we have access and to what we do not have access. Okay, these are again matters of cultural studies. Cultural imperialism is there something like cultural imperialism uh, when we have a new hegemonic uh, center that has control over power resources? Is it uh, then a fact that there is a new imperialism which is cultural in nature that we are facing matters of post coloniality of post colonialism how does then one uh, you know right sort of uh, answer or how does one as somebody put it how does one write back to the this new sort of cultural imperialism right what um, do we protect in our uh, you know national cultures and what is supposed to be a uh, healthy internationalism these are the matters okay these are the matters that are taken up uh, within a cultural studies framework fine therefore uh, it is interesting to see that uh, globalization um, involves a certain paradox okay it seems to involve a certain paradox as far as you know culture is concerned and what are these at one level there is definitely a compression okay the compression of you know uh, when when all the world so to speak is a global village there is a compression uh, with with you know um, uh, high accessibility because of internationalism, because of the flow of information. Okay, there is a certain compression of the world, right? Uh, right. So, but even as there is a compression, definitely there is also an opening up. But there is also a widening, right? There is also widen a widening because of the connections. Uh, you know um, that uh, that have been made because uh, you know owing to uh, the establishment and owing to the continue uh, you know the uh, uh, the proce continuing processes processes so to speak of globalization right uh, for instance there are, um, there is huge there are huge connections that are important connections that are made um, among nations owing to economic flows flow of capital owing to information okay so as even as we are more connected, even as we are uh, you know sort of uh, widening up, uh, the important um, thing to realize also is that there is a compression of the world. So, this is a paradox that is part and parcel of the globalizing process, right. So, um, in the next slide, 
And we are going to look at, because in, in this um, entire course, we've been also looking at, you know, uh, from time and again, I've been quoting uh, from different critics. Time and again, I've, you know, uh, tried to bring you the formulations and articulations of uh, important uh, uh, scholars in this field. Okay. One is, of course, because cultural studies is all about articulation. Uh, um, it is all about discourses, it is all about uh, uh, describing and at the same time critiquing descriptions, right. It is all about uh, discursive activities, right. So, it is very important uh, perhaps even compared to some other uh, areas, other domains, uh, this kind of looking at different articulations and form formulations is extremely important in cultural studies, which, uh, which where discourse plays a most important part. So, we are going to look at uh, one such scholar wh whose formulations are uh, very important as, uh, in, uh, as far as in particularly as globalization is concerned and um, his name is Arjun Apadurai and we are going to look at his formulation or his concept of disjunctive flows. Okay. Uh, disjunctive here, the word disjunctive means uh, lacking connection. Okay, you may see these things happening, but there is a certain uh, discreteness or autonomy to them. Okay. So, he talks about contemporary globalization as being characterized by certain flows. Okay, we have come across the term flows, remember we, we saw flows, uh, 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 we saw the importance of economic flows, of cultural flows, of international flows right? in globalization. He gives us five terms here, now let us look at these. He says that there uh, contemporary globalization is is a series or there are processes of flows and the, he calls them ethnoscapes, technoscapes, finance scapes, media scapes and idioscapes. Okay. Now, this is the flow of uh, you know flow of various um, uh, how should I put it, uh, various aspects of life. For instance, it may be finance, it may be technology, right? it may be the flow of media, it may be the flow of ideologies okay, and ethnicities. Right? The important point to note, to note here is that he calls these flows disjunctive flows or he, he, he terms them flows that need not have any connection that lack connections uh, among themselves. Okay. Nevertheless, it is to be seen as a series of processes of flows. Then what happens is because of this, right? let us look at this slide, because of this there are uh, the metaphors that we see here is because of this disjunction. Okay. The metaphors that we find here are metaphors where they, you know, there should have been, uh, uh, you know, easy accessibility, or there should have been, um, so to speak, you know, if there are so many connections, you know, if there are so many flows, if there is so so much of opening up, then there should have been a, a certainty about things, you know, more more easy accessibility to knowledge. But what happens is that th that one kind of discourse about globalization, okay, and perhaps rightly so has harped on you know uh, the increasing presence of certain kinds of metaphors okay in the discourse these are met metaphors are those of uncertainty okay contingency right and chaos this is very important at the discursive level okay at the level of discourse at the level of understanding at the level of knowledge it seems that uncertainty uh, contingency and chaos are increasingly replacing those of order, stability and systematicity. Okay. So, Apadurai points interestingly to the fact that all you know when where some may erroneously see everything in terms of you know uh, terms of systematic flows of whether economy or of finance of capital or of you know uh, culture of cultural flows and information flows okay instead of system of it being systematic we find that there is chaos disjunction okay lacking connection and order right and and the discourse is full of metaphors of instability of contingency th of things you know of things that um, uh, that seem to happen uh, happen suddenly out of certain sort of uh, certain um, uh, 
uh, a certain conglomeration of events of uh, haphazard or unconnected events right happenings are contingent upon certain random events right so order stability and systematicity right seem in culture seems to have been replaced or are being replaced by uh, instability contingency and chaos now let's read on globalization and global cultural flows cannot be understood this is important cannot be understood through neat sets of linear determinations okay rather they are better comprehended as a series of overlapping over determined complex and chaotic conditions which at best look at this word cluster around key nodal key nodal points and let's look at this very carefully okay um, it is a fiction that you know globalize then therefore it is a fiction that globalization is a sort of is a forward march right of the constant uh, or the the increasing opening up uh, opening up of uh, you know uh, cultural markets opening up of uh, uh, constant and and more accessibility to things okay on the other hand uh, these cultural flows are seen as overlapping over determined and complex and chaotic over determination is a term as um, you know some of you may know but uh, you know uh, let me talk about it over determined when are things over determined uh, this also comes from chaos theory things are said to be over determined when the set of causes that have led to a particular event is uh, you know uh, the causes are more than have been determined by us okay so or uh, are more than those that have determined it so if you think that uh, a, a particular set of causes has led to a certain event or has caused a certain event or phenomenon phenomenon okay there are other causes that are hidden uh, for whatever reason that we are uh, you know we are not in a situation in which our knowledge is not up to the mark that we can we can find out all the causes right so all when all causes are not comprehended or apprehended by us then that phenomena phenomenon sorry is said to be an overdetermined one so even uh, not simply scientific phenomena okay cultural phenomena are also then uh, over determined and uh, you find you know it is very difficult for us to completely analyze cultural flows in in this because they are random uh, they are often chaotic they are over determined and they are certainly not systematic and definitely not linear okay so you see how cultural flows also um, under globalization okay some critics have pointed to you know uh, 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 you know it was strong problematic here right so it is problematized in the sense that we cannot see it in as a linear linear march of globalization or that there are neat reasons I said neat or that there are neat sets of as it says here linear determinations of cultural flows okay so uh, an important or a useful term here is hybridization right so uh, we now have a replacement of terms here okay in the older discourse we use terms like imperialism or cultural imperialism of one you know a set of nations uh, a few uh, you know few uh, few nations having control uh, in an imperialistic uh, sort of way over culture cultural flows and of homogeneity today we have these new terms which is globalization and hybridization okay so in just you know we saw in the slide just before this that the, these are disjunctive right uh, so the point is they are hybrid in the, and the one of the best ways is to describe them as hybrid even if you cannot you know even if you cannot unpack the way this hybridization has happened even if you accept the fact that there is over determination the, the better word to hu use here is hybridization owing to this you know easy flow of cultural information across nations right so finally and this also means you know uh, uh, it also means uh, sorry um, questioning the whole concept of cultural imperialism and let us read here it is no longer the case if it ever was that the global flows of cultural discourses are constituted as one way traffic it is never one way okay 
uh, it is not necessarily a form of domination right we don't have to see it as uh, simply you know or as it says here one way traffic in which or one set of nations dominates another set and uh, it is not clear that globalization is a, is a simple process of homogenization. Okay? We cannot say that the world is becoming again homogenized, uh, because the forces of fragmentation and hybridity are equally as strong. So, we see these forces that pull and push so to speak, okay? even in the cultural domain. Right? So, we cannot we see we saw the paradox as it were of, uh, of connections increasing widening. Uh, you know of flows and at the same time a compression of the world. So, it seems at in a globalized situation one has to acknowledge and, and then live uh, in an understanding of things as not uh, you know being completely saturated by power uh, from one set of nations on another. We have to understand things as being over determined as overlapped as hybrid uh, where questions of power. Uh, and imperialism are not so straightfully worked out. Fine. So, uh, we will now look at um, a few questions that uh, may come up in your you know in your uh, in your exams and let us see how best to answer these. If you get a question like cite the three chief orientations of scholars towards globalization, then your answer would be this. The three positions that are you know are usually um, um, usually occupied or adhered to by scholars are those of hyper globalization of skepticism and of transformationalism and we found that in a hyper globalized uh, in the situation or position of hyper globalization what do scholars do then you have to say that scholars uh, point to globalization as something that is imperative something that is going to happen and it also spells the, the end of nation states. Under transformationalism, you may say that uh, you know the fact that nations are uh, almost irrevocably uh, affected by, by you know by this new connectivity of uh, sorry of these new connections uh, is, is uh, sort of accepted by scholars, but they are not ready to accept that there is an impending you know end or doom so to speak of the nation state. And finally, uh, the, on the other extreme we have the skeptics who hold uh, uh, on to the belief uh, that the nation state is definitely there to stay okay? and they are very skeptical about uh, what others see as this whole march of globalization, globalization spreading to all corners so to speak of the world. Next, if you get a question like this what are the processes underlying globalization? Then the processes, the three main processes underlying globali globalization are you say economics, internationalism and information. Okay. Contemporary globalization then you may say is informed by the flow of capital, okay, by the increasing okay, deregulation of capital flows from one nation into another. It is also under uh, you know uh, the underlying another important underlying process is internationalism uh, of international bodies of global mergers of multinational companies. Uh, then information the flow of information the ready flow of electronic data. Okay. So, these are the processes that have enabled globalization to happen. Then what is the place of culture in the global order? The answer is in the global order when you talk about globalization culture may be seen first as an economic good. Okay. The parallel here is between economics and culture okay. if or uh, if there are capital flows the you know uh, easy capital flows underlying globalization in culture okay, like an economic good cul there are also cultural flows where also there is a sort of neo, neo uh, liberalism as far as the flow of cultural goods and resources are concerned. There are uh, you know increasingly um, a minimal uh, you know lift uh, minimal re regulations as far as flow of cultural forms is concerned products is concerned. And um, uh, also that in uh, that you know um, there are there is the um, there is the enabling of global mergers as far as even cultural institutions like education is concerned okay the investment of in education across national borders okay so 
one cultural form education and of course, there are other cultural forms like media etcetera as we saw uh, in the case of Arjun Apadurai's formulations. And we then we say that globalization however, okay, even if you even if you call it an economic good it is not completely so why because it has to do with issues of cultural meaning of it has important implications for our ways of life. It has important implications as far as the uh, what kinds of cultural forms are available to us which determine the consumption of cultural forms. Then another question what specifically does cultural studies study in globalization. Okay? And we saw that we may say that though globalization is a, um, uh, a term that is interdisciplinary in nature, it lends itself definitely to economics, to sociology, to anthropology, to political science, even to literature. If we were to finally, zoom in on what is studied in globalization, uh, in cultural studies as far as globalization is concerned, then we will say after Chris Barker that it concerns the exploration of consumer of stuff like sorry of things like consumer culture, global culture, cultural imperialism and post coloniality or culture uh, that, that, that is a cul, uh, scholar in cultural studies is going to not, not going to study economic flows in globalization so much as he or she is going to study the you know or going to explore or the implications of globalization of economic flows for consumer culture for instance, for media culture for instance, okay. what it means, what are the meanings that uh, new meanings, what are the new uh, signifying practices or new significations that come up when we say that there is something called a global culture, what is cultural imperialism problematizing the whole concept sometimes of cultural imperialism and insisting on hybridity okay, saying that it is not a one way traffic. Okay the things are more hybrid and power and the flow of power is more hybrid than is <coughs> excuse me is, is usually um, attested. And finally, uh, how post colonial nations uh, try and try and protect uh, perhaps or negotiate their own cultures. So, we come to the final question here and this refers to uh, the formulation by Arjun Apadurai. If you get a question which does not uh, mention Apadurai, but says something like this, what are the disjunctive flows within globalization. Okay? So, the moment you uh, look at the word disjunctive, then you understand that you have to answer this with the formulations given by Apadurai and you say that according to the scholar Arjun uh, Apadurai. Uh, Globalization may um, you know or the contemporary situation is one that is informed by disjunctive flows and that disjunctive flows are basically flows that do not have any uh, you know um, any any very apparent connection they are they are discrete and these are are the different scapes that he calls he calls these ethnoscapes technoscapes, finance scapes, media scapes and idioscapes now not necessary that these have to show very uh, you know a very um, uh, apparent or very obvious connections. These are disjunctive in nature fine. So, I hope uh, this lecture was um, that this lecture was useful to you and uh, definitely there are so there is so much else to talk about as far as globalization is concerned from various perspectives. But um, uh, it was my uh, you know what I wanted to do here basically was to uh, show you some aspects uh, of studying globalization within cultural studies, some of the formulations, some of the difficulties okay, uh, on in level, some of the paradoxes that we have seen okay, as far as talking about globalization within the cultural studies rubric is concerned. Okay. Thank you so much.